So I'm going to start doing this is something I'm going to try to do as many times as possible. Last week my segment went really quick and we kind of talked about how to identify different species of fish on your electronics. And one thing that I, that I do get asked quite a bit is about how to set up on offshore structure when you're graphing fish. And I always tell people, well, it, it's different. It's different on every piece of structure that I graph. And one factor is definitely wind. That's a big factor. Uh, another factor is how the fish are positioned on the structure. Because who's heard of parallel on a bank? Like when fish are shallow, let's say you're fishing a bank that's lined with reeds, right? and the fish are holding on the edge of those reeds. Who's heard of putting your boat right up on the bank so you can parallel those reeds? Well, when fish are offshore, if they're set up one direction or the other, wouldn't you be best advised to put your bait wherever they're set up the longest so that your bait can stay in the, the school the longest? You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So when I grab, and, and Ronnie does things a little differently. <coughs> Listen, like I said last week, there's no absolutes. There's always a different way to do it, and sometimes your way is going to work better than mine, and sometimes my way is going to work better than yours. Ronnie does this completely different. I know he does. Uh, and I do have an exception to this rule that we'll talk about here in a minute, but let's get started. So I've drawn a couple points here, and basically I've, these dots, so what I'll do is I'll come up here and I'll start zigzagging my boat up and down this point looking for fish. And what I do in my boat is every time that I see what I am really, really sure is a bass or a small group of bass, I will put a fish icon waypoint on. If it's one bass, I'll put it right on it. If it's a group of three or four bass, well, if there's three or four dots, I'll put it. I'll put an icon, a fish icon right here, and a fish icon right here where that group starts and ends. So I know that's all fish, okay? And so I'll graph up and down this point. What I've drawn out here is these are all fish icons. Pretend these are my fish waypoints, okay? These dots on this point, right? So right here, you can see these fish are set up kind of at this angle here. Okay, now no matter what the wind direction is doing, I will be able to make a somewhat decent presentation from either over here or over here. So if the wind's blowing this way, right, I'm gonna come set my boat up over here so I can throw downwind. With spot lock now, we can all go to the back of the boat, make the right cast and have a good time, right? If the wind's blowing this way across that school, but they're set up like this on the structure for whatever reason, you can still come set up a little bit upwind of them right here and still throw and bring your bait through the majority of that school. The ideal here is just to keep your bait in the school for as long as possible. Okay, and if you're throwing a deep crankbait, one thing that's important is positioning close enough where you, you can throw far enough past the school to get your bait on the bottom by the time it's entering the school. That's important because if you ain't bumping, if you ain't banging, you ain't bassing. If you ain't banging, you ain't bassing. So that crankbait needs to be contacting drawing those reaction bites from those bass. Um, but that's kind of my quick tip tonight on your electronics and how to set up. So down here, we're gonna try to set the boat up right here or right here. No matter what direction the wind's blowing, I wanna be throwing slightly downwind to all the way downwind. And I wanna be set up where I can keep my bait in the school of bass as long as possible. Is there any questions on that? Yeah, I didn't see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was a statement. <laughs> these, these are. These are just like little schools of bass that I've marked. So where do you have the boat? So I'll, I'm going to set my boat up either right here or right here. And if the wind's blowing this way, then it's easy. You set up right here and you throw off the back of the boat. If the wind's blowing this way, okay, what I want to do is set up kind of right here, just a little bit upwind, and then I can still cover most of the school and still throw slightly downwind. That's going to keep most of that bow out of your line. You know, if you throw directly sideways into the wind or into the wind, you're going to lose contact with a lot of your baits. If you're throwing uh, a, a shaky head or if you're throwing a drop shot, and you're crossing that wind real bad or you're going in that wind, you can lose a lot of contact with your bait and you can miss a bite. Uh, so I always want to be trying to throw downwind at least somewhat. And depending on where the crest of the, of the structure is, you know, if you've got a shallower spot, the wind and the current can play into it. Lake Fork current's not that big of a deal, but if you've got a lot of these lakes that do have current, that can play in. So if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a hump or a point, let's say a ridge, and you've got your bass set up over here, your best bet, depending on, you know, even with the wind, is going to be to set up to be able to throw over and come around. Because I kind of I kind of explain structure fishing like scaring somebody in a hallway. You stand at the corner of the hallway, somebody comes down, your goal is to jump out and scare them. It's the same thing with bass fishing. If, those, if you've got a ridge right here and those bass are set up right here, they're expecting the bait to come over to the top of that ridge so they can ambush up, right? And that's why we try to keep our baits above See, bass. And it, this is... One of my favorite things 
about doing this with, with a guy like Ronnie is seeing these differences, the way that we think about it. And Ronnie's got more time on the water than me. Uh, he's got more time offshore than me. So who am I to argue with him? But it, for me, I've never, I don't ever really consider I need to be bringing it over the hill and down. I'll drag it uphill. I'll drag it side hill. I'll drag yeah. it downhill. I just want to keep it in the school as long as possible. However, the general shape of the school is, that's the direction I want to fish. Now, there's one exception to this. When I'm graphing, and I see what I consider to be, man, that's it. You know, like if I'm if I'm graphing, this is I'm seeing a fish here and a fish here, two fish there, three fish here, one fish there, and they're kind of spread out a little bit, which is what you're gonna find the majority of the time, correct? Mm -hmm. You're not always gonna drive up there and they're gonna be dum, 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 just stacked up all at one time on your graph. By all means, if you drive over there and you see 10 or 15 or 20 fish stacked up on your graph in one spot, hey, just get up one of that sucker, hit the spot lock and go to casting. Don't waste your time graphing anymore. Mark one spot in the center and hit that spot. If you find the mother load, if you find a big school of fish all watered up tight together and you know they're bass, boys, just stop, get set up and go to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I won't do all this if I see that, you know, that holy cow when you look at your graph moment. Um, it's most of the time though it's little pods it's two fish three fish one fish and they're kind of spread out a little bit it's when i see that to me that's when this is really important to make sure that bait is staying and presenting to as many of those fish as possible on every cast that's, yeah. that's and then and then working around the structure you know mm -hmm. uh there's times you know uh that i've seen on points where i've got a group of fish a good group of fish there'll be times where i'll pull up 8 10 12 15 fish and i can't get them to bite and I'll position the boat a complete different way, and all of a sudden I'll get one of them to bite. And a lot of times one of them to bite is all you need. And yeah. so moving around that, throwing different baits, getting on different presentations, but at times, depending on current, and we do at times, right now you got a lot of current. You got a whole lot of water coming in and a whole lot of water going, going out. out. Yeah. That that messes up fish a little bit out here more than it does on uh, maybe a uh, Tennessee River it Lake. It takes or something a little like while to get used to it out here because it's not, like this yeah, year it's kind of it become a normal thing, but it's not normally a normal thing. They were kind of just getting settled into no current, and then they got hit with a bunch more current this week. Speaking of that, who saw what happened to the lake level this week? <laughs> Show of hands. 14 inches, not I mean, just, yeah. hey, I went to bed the other night, it had rained a little bit, and then I woke up and showed up at the lake, and I had to beach my boat in the St. Augustine. And I was like, well, what happened? Apparently it rained the whole time I was sleeping on top of Lake Fork and it jumped up over a foot overnight in like five, six hours. So the the topic that I wanted to cover with you guys tonight is fishing flooded conditions, uh, fishing dirty water and fishing flooded conditions. Now this is going to be shallow water stuff. Boys, there's still a lot of fish that live shallow year round on Fork. Uh, this year the offshore bite's been real good. And so I've spent a lot more time offshore. I've normally spent a lot of time shallow. The offshore bite's been real good, and a lot of that stuff hadn't been that crowded. At times it has been, yeah. but a lot of times it's not. So um, It has been a, a, a bit inconsistent at times. It's though. been inconsistent. It has. Yeah. You ain't going to catch them six days in a row, five, six days in a row. That's true. That's true. That's true. So the topic I wanted to dig into you guys with, because I, I do kind of, I guess, claim to be more of a shallow water guy. I certainly grew up. I've got more experience fishing shallow water. And growing up in southeast Texas, I've got a lot of experience fishing dirty, flooded water. We get a lot of that down there. Um, so I just want to kind of go over some baits, some techniques, and just some little tricks of the trade, I guess you might say, to kind of dial in on where can you locate the best shallow water fishing areas when you're presented with tough, flooding, dirty water conditions. So the first thing that, that, that I can tell you is relative clarity is of the utmost importance in this situation. So if you run to the back of a creek, let's say Birch Creek or Little Mustang, take your pick. That water's gonna be dirty. It's gonna be like, it's gonna be dirty. And there's gonna be a lot, like the whole creek's gonna be dirty. But if you do some map study, okay, get on Google Earth. This the Google Earth is a big deal on this. And what you need to find is the little small areas that don't get flow. Because if you can find one of those areas that, that doesn't flow into the back of it, and if you can get lucky enough to have some grass out in that area, there will be a section in that little pocket that will have much cleaner water than the rest of it because that dirty water will flow from the back of the creek and that grass will keep it from going in and it'll bypass that area. And boys, them fish will flood to that in this situation. They will flood to that cleaner water, especially in the summertime, they'll get, all of them will get in there. Um, so 
looking for little subtle areas that don't get the same amount of flow. Who's familiar with Birch Creek? Pretty much most of the guys here. So who's familiar with the trout pond? Anybody know what trout pond is? Okay, let's draw you a quick picture because you know my art is so good. So, Birch Creek kind of comes out like this, does this thing, comes out like this, and then this sticks over here, and then you got this, and you got this, right? Is that a nipple? Yeah, yeah, that's what that is, Ronnie. You sorry, sucker, I tell you what. Anyway, this is not a good drawing of Birch Creek, but it'll, it'll serve the purpose. Okay. This is Birch Creek. This is where the majority of the flow is coming from the top, going down. Just like you're looking north to south, this flows from north to south. So most of your flow, the bulk of your flow from fresh water, dirty water, is going to be coming in from the top side. This is a little bay in Birch Creek. There is a significant size channel that flows in right here. It's not nearly as big as the Big Creek Channel, but it's a significant channel. You can take your boat way back in the woods in it. There's a whole little channel that flows in right here. It flows really hard when it rains. This right here, this is the trout pond. Not as much this year as in years past, but a lot of times this will be chock full of grass all out here. Chock full of grass. That back there in this situation is absolute gold. All these fish in this area will filter their way into that clean oxygenated water with all that grass and get in that clear water where they can hunt down the bait fish. The bait fish will be running back there. I mean, it just, it's money. So this is the type of situation, flow, flow, no flow, cover at the mouth to make that dirty water bypass it. Yeah. Big flow, secondary flow. And you hear a lot of tournament grass, fishermen, right back here especially coming. early early on in the year, you'll hear somebody go, yeah, we went to the back of the creek and we found clear water. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Or this is the about. exact thing right here. So that's your first deal is, I guess just don't settle for the dirtiest water right just i mean do some map study get on google earth find subtle little things like this where you and you can see on google earth you can see this creek it winds way back here and this one's obvious it's the big huge creek arm that runs to the roof or wherever it goes i mean it runs dang near out of yeah. the county you know um right here the power lines are right here so <laughs> trout pods so you're right gonna here. hit the power line and make a bigger out. yeah yeah these are the power lines. the boat lane ends right here the buoys end right there that's the power lines you got this big bay but you there's know, areas like that all over the lake there's areas like all that all over the lake, lake. all we, over every lake and, and a lot of times what will we'll even if you go looking on google earth that's why i say google earth is important when you look on google earth guys a lot of times what you'll see is when you look at this area on google earth and you go to look zooming in on it you'll see that looks darker than the rest of the water no matter when they took the picture because lakes are always getting flow into them right and even if this is really clear, that's gonna be even more clear. So when you look on Google Earth, you can kind of identify these subtle little areas. You can see, okay, there's no creek coming in. There's darker water in the back of this small little pocket. And you can start finding some hot spots to go check. You know, there's times when that'll get dirty back there, but usually this is gonna be cleaner than the rest of it. Okay, so that's how you find that. Now let's talk about when you're fishing, now that doesn't mean you're going to go back there and you're going to see the bottom and it's going to be bathtub clear. Sometimes it does. Sometimes, like last spring when the whole lake got dirty, I made my living every day back here because it was bathtub clear back here because we had a huge amount of grass in the mouth of it. Zach caught a 10 pounder while that was going on. The, the whole lake was dirty. Ten six. Don't forget them six ounces, dog. Don't forget them six ounces. And we had like, what we have, 30 something pounds that day? All right in this, I mean, this is an area not much bigger than this room. Never left that pocket. And maybe two of these rooms or so where it was really, really gin clear water uh, and it was spawning season and the whole lake was dirty, but this little pocket was clean. So that's just an example of how well that can work. So now that doesn't mean it's going to be bathtub gin clear, but it's going to be cleaner. And if it's cleaner, the bass will go use it. The bass that are in that general area will go use that. So let's talk about how to catch fish in dirty water. Here's the number one thing you need to know. They're going to relate to hard, the hardest cover they can, and they're going to relate to it extremely tight. So if you're in a basketball gym and the lights are on 
and I'm schooling, I'm crossing him up, like RK's out there and I'm just doing him, right? And then all of a sudden somebody turns the lights out and it's pitch black dark and I can't even see Ronnie's white butt. Well, what's the first thing you're going to do in that situation? You're going to start feeling around. You're going to go find them benches. You're going to get next to something where you can kind of feel where you are in the gym, correctly? I mean, cor correctly. I'll talk one of these days. Um, but you understand what I'm saying there? So these fish, when that water gets dirty, it's like somebody's kind of turning their lights down. And they're going to want to get close to something so they can kind of relate to something and feel secure. That's what they're going to do. So this lake's full of stumps. If you got a little bit cleaner water, that's going to put more fish in that area. If they got stumps and that water's still dirty and stained back there, boys, they're going to get right next to them stumps. They will use grass edges as well, but they will prefer hard cover. Docks are great in this city. Docks are a condominium for bass in this situation. This is, dock fishing is amazing when that water gets dirty. Okay, so what baits do we use? Well, if they can't see it real good, we're, we're gonna, A, we're gonna need baits that we can fish through flooded cover of, efficiently. That's the most important thing. You can't go slinging a rattle trap in flooded bushes very well now, can you? Right? So you gotta pick baits that work well in the situation you're in. Um, I like flipping and frogging is kind of your first two options to me, especially if the water is rising or level, not dropping. Once it starts dropping, I kind of go to some other baits, but start fishing more on the edges. Boy, I'm getting them. Squirrel, squ squirrel. Okay, bear with me for a second. Got ahead of myself. When that water is rising or staying at the high level, not dropping yet, it hasn't turned around and started dropping, as the water climbs, the fish climb. Okay? So as that water's rising and staying up, they will go up into the jump, up into the flooded cover, up into the bushes. Flipping and frogging are your two best options in this situation. I want you to flip dark baits. I want you to flip heavy baits. I don't, it doesn't need to be a light Texas rig. You can flip like a half ounce jig, a three eighths ounce jig, black and blue, crawl, flaps a lot, moves a lot of water, put the rattles on it, cause as much commotion as you can and get a good dark profile. Uh, when you're frogging, I like a black frog in this situation with muddy water. Um, just a solid color. White can do really well too. I just like, I want it to be a solid hard color. Black is my favorite in, in high muddy water conditions. Um, the other two, the other couple things that work really good now, a swim jig, a swim jig is a very, very good option in flooded conditions. You can throw a swim jig through most flooded cover very efficiently. It can help you cover water to locate where some fish are holding. Uh, you know, when that, a lot of part of the fish in flooded lakes is there's a lot to fish. Like there's a lot more stuff to cover now. Well, a swim jig can be a really efficient tool where you can skip it, get it up under stuff, get it back in the junk and burn it out and get reactions. Even if you don't catch them, they'll show themselves to you. And once you've found some fish, now you can slow down and flip and frog and catch them. Um, so if you're needing to cover water, the swim jig's the deal. Um, if it's flooded water and there's not a lot of shoreline cover flooded, but you kind of just got a shallow stump field or something like that, I love, I love, love, love a chartreuse blackback square bill in this situation. If it's just wood, it's not really heavy grass, it's not really flooded bushes, um, it's just muddy water in a shallow stump flat. I think a chartreuse blackback square bill is the best thing you can throw in this situation uh, to cover water again. Now, once you find fish, slow down and flip those stumps. Um, and then when it starts falling, so it's gone up, the fish go up. It stayed up, it leveled off. They're going to kind of stay there in that junk, in that fresh flooded cover. They love it. They're going to stay there. When it starts falling, they're going to, as soon as it starts falling, they're going to the old shoreline, boys. That's the first move. The first move is they're going to the old shoreline. I don't care if it's Lake of the Pines and it's 12 feet high. I don't care if it's Lake Fork and it's one feet high. When they get in the flooded junk, so the second the water starts falling, those fish are making their way to the old bank line. And then as it gets closer, they'll move even further out. In, in Lake of the Pines, they may be in 10 foot of water. Understand? So you may have 10 foot high conditions at like Toledo Bend or Lake of the Pines or Rayburn. And they, they're all up in the junk. And then as soon as that water starts falling, it might still be nine foot high. But they're on the old bank line in nine foot of water. That's where, in my experience, as soon as it starts falling, they go to the old shoreline right away. So in that situation, flipping and uh, deeper diving square bill crankbaits, crank, square bill crankbaits that you can get five, six foot deep, the bigger body square bill crankbaits, the 2.5s, uh, what we call it in six cents, the 200 series. I don't even know what's going on. series. I know the movement of 3.8 mm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, NASCAR now? That's um, my favorite ones. 
the uh, the the movement L7 is a good one that'll get about five six foot deep, and then there is the Crush 100X. That's what I was trying to think of. That's the one for six cents that I like. It's like a 2.5 size body. The 3.8 mini mag is another one that'll get five six seven foot deep with the right line. So when you start getting those fish pull out to that old shoreline, if it's got some depth on it, I want to cover that old shoreline and bang it off as much cover as I can with those baits. Boy, we're going over a lot of stuff right now. Yep, yep. But good stuff. flooded, stuff flooded, happening. flooded water is—it's a complicated issue. It's—it's it's constantly changing. Um, that might be about it. And yeah, and then just as it falls, you just follow them back out, and they'll just from that shoreline they'll kind of pull back out to what they would use at normal lake level before it gets back to normal lake level. Cool. Right? I think it's good. So if you guys are fishing this weekend. That should help. If you're a shallow water fisherman, you want to go grind it out shallow this weekend, take some of that stuff we just talked about. You know, go flipping, go frogging, go swim jigging. Look for that cleaner water. That's the biggest thing I can tell you is look for that cleaner water. Do some studying on Google Earth. Try to find some areas that are highly likely to have cleaner water and, and dig into those. Um, and then go get after them. Hard fishing when it's flooded. Like, when you got flooded conditions and there's a tournament, the guy that fishes the hardest wins. The guy that's the most efficient, makes a lot more cash, like that's the guy that wins usually. Hard fishing with the flood, you gotta work hard at it. Any questions tonight on anything? Yes, sir. Is it falling now or is it still it's, open? It's falling. Is yeah, it started to fall? Yeah. All the gates are open, yeah. Well, I know all the gates are open, but I didn't yeah, know if it's falling. Okay. There you go. So it's falling now. So they're gonna pull back out just a little bit. So how fast does this happen? As this as this water changes from fall to rising, how fast do they adapt to that immediately so it's immediately okay. i want to know and, and i'm watching it that morning yeah the eyeball test is the best thing so when a lake's flooded you can always see the new water line like if you can't see the old water line well it's still rising or it's stable one it's still going up or staying the same but when it starts coming down on docks trees bushes grass whatever that's sticking out of the water you'll see that that old water line well as soon as it starts to do this I go back out to the old bank line. That's the first place I go start looking in. And as this starts to get closer to normal, then I'll back out to where I would normally fish is if it wasn't flooded. Still looking for the cleaner water. That's the biggest factor. Still looking for the cleaner water. Um, it happens really, I mean, they, they will move with it quick. You're not talking about a big move in a lot of situations on a lake like this. It's not like they have to migrate a long way. This is why I say docks are the most wonderful thing in this situation. Because a dock, those fish will go way back under that dock and then they'll go back to the old bank line on that dock and then they'll pull out to the end of that dock. And it's all in one little tight condensed area that you can pick all the way apart and really work over. Uh, docks are a godsend in flooded conditions, in my opinion. Any other questions? No, nothing. Awesome. Who's hungry? I'm hungry. I'm about to go eat me some prime rib, boy. Oh, no. Real quick, I'm fixing to start running night trips and split day trips. If anybody's interested, I'm gonna be fishing first four hours or so of the day and the last four hours or so of the day and then i'll be doing some some night trips and i've got a camper for rent out here just bought a camper so uh, i got a camper for rent it's pretty inexpensive you guys got it's on on the water right close to oak ridge marina so anybody interested in that big tournament to get full you want a nice queen size bed with good air conditioning and private boat ramp you it's kind of nice it. tv and that's all it's got a nice tv it's got two recliners and nice tv recliners, i was like bed. shoot boy i'm gonna be divorced because i ain't yeah. going home yeah. <laughs> so heck yeah man well, hey thank you guys so much for doing everything that y'all do like we always say we really appreciate it um uh, question question so how, on the fish finder how do you tell if it's bass and it's not some other kind of fish? how do you tell if it's a bass and it's not some other kind of fish okay we, we kind of went over this last week but uh, we'll go over it again it's the way they relate to each other. Um, you know, most of the other fish that you're going to graph offshore out here are going to be uh, sand bass, yellow bass, crappie. Those are kind of your typical species. Those, they're on a sonar, their arcs will be kind of intermingled, okay? Bass will always have separation, always. Very rarely will you see bass just pile up. There's exceptions to every rule, but it's pretty rare. I've got one right here from just the other day that's a good example for you to see. Um, let me find out one that's got all four of them. That one's real good. Because you can see four different examples here. So if you look at these pictures, you'll see the separation in the group. <coughs> see how there's like an arc, an arc, an arc? They're all separated. Yeah. They're not 
but when you see sand bass, those arcs will be like this. Yes, sir. Those are those are all bass right there. So if, if you if you if it's sand bass or crappie or whatever, those arcs will be like this. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like the arcs will be crossed up, and it almost looks like one big blob, but you can kind of see arcs in it. Those are the other species. It's that separation. That bass yep, they, they have separation of, and then there's a general shape to them that I've found for me. I think there's a general shape to them. I think uh, uh, yellow bass are like carpet. They get like this. They get flat and tight to the bottom and real tight together. Sand bass are like shag carpet. Same thing, just a little bit taller. Crappie will stack up like a tree, even when they're not on a tree, they'll stack vertically more. And sand bass will stack vertically sometimes, but a lot of times they'll just be across the bottom like the yellow bass are. Um, and then the bass will be more just an oval shape, just kind of a round oval shape with the separation in the arcs. That's how the bass tend to look when they're grouped up, just like all those pictures you just saw right there. How deep were those fish? Mm, these were taken a while back, I think. Some of these, like that group right there, I can see the depth on the side, that's in like 23. All these images I've been taking have been anywhere from like 18 all the way down to, I have some from the other day as deep as like 27, 28. So, they've, they've been changing and a lot. And they look the same in eight foot as they do in 30 foot. They, they've been changing a lot, you know, with all the different conditions that we've had as far as the depth they're holding the best in. See this one right here, you can kind of see the depth, that's between 25 and 30 there. That was from just, uh, the day before, yesterday, that was from yesterday actually. All right, any other questions? I don't like to leave any questions unanswered. So. No? Everybody's good? Awesome. Hey, thank you guys so much. Can't say thank you all enough. We thank Lake Fork Marina. We'll see you all next time right here. I don't normally do that. See you all later. Go eat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Benny. Yes, sir. Thank you all.